slope. And I know slope is another topic that you have talked about forever in your math classes. But believe it or not, slope is actually a huge concept in calculus. We will approach it a little differently than you have before. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a really, really big topic in calculus. Okay, so let's go back to the basics first. And um, over time, we'll, we'll change what we call slope and what we do with it. Okay, so how would I, um, we are going to graph some lines. So as Jacob did, if you want, actually, yeah, I don't know, some of them are sketching. Okay, if you do want a ruler, you can run over here and grab one. Okay, so for example one, graph y equals 4, and then decide whether it is a function or not. What does the line y equals 4 look like? Yeah, it's horizontal, right? So it's telling me all the y coordinates on this line are 4. So 0, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, negative 1, 4, negative 2, 4. All those are points on our line. So that gives us a line that is just horizontal. What is the slope of that line? How steep is it? Not steep at all, so the slope is 0. Okay, is it a function? Of course. Okay, graph x equals negative 3. What does this line look like? Or is it a line? I don't even see a y in it. Can I put this in y equals mx plus b form? No, but it is linear. It's the only linear equation that doesn't have a y in it. All the others will have y equals or can be put in that form. Okay, so think about this. It means it doesn't matter what y is, the x is going to be negative 3. So if I think of some ordered pairs, negative 3, 0, negative 3, 1, negative 3, 3, negative 3, negative 2, all those points would be on the line. So what we end up with is a vertical line. A function? Of course not. Uh, what's the slope here? Undefined. Undefined slope. So steep we couldn't even walk on it. Okay. Give me a little sketch here of these two. And sketch the graph of x equals 4 and y equals negative 3. Wow, that's loud. The computer is recording my voice, and the computer is recording whatever's on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very handy. That's why I stay tethered to all this, because it it works that well. Okay, so x equals 4 is a what kind of line? Vertical line at x equals 4. And y equals negative 3 is what kind of line? Horizontal at y equals negative 3. Okay, so the graph of y equals c, and c is a constant here. In other words, just a number. Oh, or f of x equals c is a horizontal line. Um, it is a function. Such a function is referred to as a constant function. And that is because the equation is just equal to a constant. Another word for constant is a plain old number. I guess it wasn't one word. Uh, the graph of x equals a is a vertical line. It is not the graph of a function. Okay. The variable y varies directly as x if there is some positive constant m such that y equals mx. We also say that y is directly proportional to x. Okay, is this an equation of a line? y equals mx? Yeah, we use that form with y equals mx plus b, but in this case b is 0. So if we think of y equals mx plus b, 
This is our y-intercept, m is the slope. But basically we're saying, okay, for b equals 0, y equals mx would be our equation. And we call that a direct proportion, or we say that y varies directly. Okay, so if I graph any line in this form, what's it going to look like visually? Um, I mean, they don't have a similarity. They might have different slopes. They might be slanted different ways. But anything that is a direct proportion or varies directly as something else will just be a line that goes through the origin. Can y'all read cursive? My son struggles with it because he never... They never really, really learned it in school. Did y'all? Yeah, I did. I mean, we, when we were in third grade, we had to start writing a cursive, and that was yeah. it. But my son, they did not. Like, it was kind of like, this is what cursive is. Okay, moving on. So, I had to... Really? Yeah, his cursive is terrible. It's important because think of all those old historical documents. They're all in cursive. Like if generations stop learning cursive, they're not going to be able to translate those, and they're fancy. Like sometimes they're hard to read. Also, a lot easier for the signatures just in Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, okay, so here are various graphs of y equals mx for positive values of m. So this is saying these are just some sample lines y equals mx where m is a positive number. Y equals 3x, 2x, 1x. So as we mentioned, they're all going through the origin. These are all lines that represent y equals mx for negative values of m or negative slopes. Again, they're all crossing through the origin. Okay, so often you'll see direct variations as word problems. Uh, for example, this one. The weight m in pounds of an object on the moon is directly proportional to the weight e of an object on Earth. An astronaut who weighs 180 pounds on Earth will weigh 28.8 pounds on the moon. Find an equation of variation, and then an astronaut who weighs 120 pounds on Earth uh, will weigh how much on the moon. Okay, let's go back to this for one second. If y varies directly as x, then we set up this y equals mx. Okay, so the one that comes first comes first in the equation. Okay, y varies directly as x, y equals mx. All right, so let's go over here. The weight m is directly proportional to e. That means that m varies directly with e. That tells me that my equation is m equals slope times e. And I don't like those two m's being there, but we'll make that one capital just like it is in the problem. Okay, so weight varies directly with e, tells me m equals slope times e is our equation. Now I'm going to use this given information to figure out what the slope is. So an astronaut weighs 180 pounds on earth. That goes here. Okay, so I have something times 180 um, will weigh 28.8 on the moon. That goes here. I need to find what that slope is. Okay, so what I'll do is just divide by 180. I want to isolate m. It's being multiplied by 180, so we're going to divide. Oh, grab a calculator. I don't want to do that one in my head. 28.8 divided by 180. 0.16 m equals 0.16. Okay, so now I know that my equation is m equals 0.16 times e. So given information, we find the slope. Now we can apply that 
to part B. An astronaut weighs 120 pounds on Earth. That goes out here. How much will he weigh or she weigh on the moon? We want to find M. So M equals 0.16 times his Earth weight or her Earth weight, which is 120. And let's multiply that. So on the moon, they would weigh 19.2 pounds. Okay, there is another way to do this one. As with direct proportions, we can just set up a proportion problem. And a proportion is when you have two fractions that are equal. So I could say that I'm going to set up a fraction with m over e equals m over e, and then cross multiply. And I use the sub ones for the first set of information and the sub two for the second bit of information. And I could put e's in the numerator and m's in the denominator. Okay, so let's set it up this way. Okay, so the first moon weight that we were given was 28.8. And the first earth weight that we were given is 180. So the second moon, that's what I'm looking for. The second earth weight was 120. And so now we have a proportion where we can just cross multiply. Okay, so let's multiply across here. I get 180m equals 120 times 28.8 is three, four, five, six. And I'm gonna divide by 180. And I should get the same thing. And I do. Okay, so that's two different ways of doing a proportion. Personally, I like this one, but works the same way um, however you want to choose. Okay, next page. Okay, a linear function is any function that can be written in the form y equals mx plus b or f of x equals mx plus b. Its graph has the same slope m as the graph of y equals mx and crosses the y-axis at 0b. So as we know, that is just our y-intercept. The point as an order pair being 0, comma b. The point 0, b is called the y-intercept. There we go. Okay, y equals mx plus b is called the slope-intercept form of a line or of a linear equation. I'm going to interject that. Slope-intercept form of the linear equation. All right, find an equation of the line with slope 3 containing the point negative 1, negative 5. Okay, so if my slope is 3, that means m is 3. This will serve as an x and a y value in the equation. Okay, so let's start with y equals mx plus b, just sort of as a formula, and sub in the x, sub in the y, sub in the m, We'll find b, and then we can go back and write the equation. Okay, so negative 5 equals 3 times negative 1 plus b. So I have negative 5 equals negative 3 plus b. Add 3 to both sides, and I get negative 2 equals b. Okay, I'm not done. I'm looking to write the equation of the line. So let's put all of that back in to y equals mx plus b. And I have y equals mx plus b, but I'll make it minus 2 since it was a negative. Mm -hmm. Right here? Oh, I just added in form of a linear equation. It means the same thing. The reason I was um, kind of picky about that is we're actually going to use a different form of a linear equation more often than we use this one. 
you don't know about it yet, but it will become the most common form of a linear equation that we use. Alright. Oh, here it is. What about that? Okay, so this is actually a form of a linear equation that we will use a whole bunch. And it seems really weird at first, but it's very useful because it's fast. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Y minus Y sub 1 equals M times X minus X sub 1. Sub 1. It looks a lot more complex. It's called the point-slope equation form, or I'm going to say point-slope form of a linear equation. Okay, so what, and there's a whole bunch of letters here. X1, Y1 represent a point on a line, and M is still the slope. So what are the normal X and Y values? Well, you know how when you write an equation of a line, you have to have x, y to represent all the ordered pairs on the line. So that is still what this x and y without a subscript represent. But then the y1, x1 represents the numbers for a known point on the line. Okay, so let's, I'm going to, before we do this example, I'm going to take this same information that we had back here. We had a slope of 3. And we had the ordered pair negative 1, negative 5. And I'm going to write the same equation of the line just using this form. Okay, so I would write y minus negative 5 equals m times x minus negative 1. Okay, so that becomes y plus 5, and this becomes 3 times x plus 1. That would be the point-slope form of this line. It is the same equation, and I'm going to prove to you that it is by distributing the 3 and then moving the 5 over. But we often just leave the equation like this and don't simplify it. And a lot of people have trouble with that at first because your teachers previously have drilled into you. Simplify, simplify, simplify. When we are using point slope form, we don't simplify. We just leave it and move on, which is nice when you have a lot of fractions. It's like, oh, there it is. I'm going to step away from it. Okay, but if I did distribute here, I would have y plus 5 equals 3x plus 3 and then I would subtract 5 and get y equals 3x minus 2, which is exactly what we got back there. Okay, so at first it looks a little more complex, but for most of you, I'm going to venture to say it will probably become your favorite form. Um, the one advantage here, we didn't have to find b, did we? We never found b. It's there, it's worked into the problem. If I really need B, then I can simplify this out. But let me ask you this. If all you knew was the slope in that point, could we still graph it? Like, do we have to have B to graph a line? No. We either need two points or we need a point and the slope. So if I were going to graph this and I had that information, I would plot that ordered pair rise 3, run 1. And you've got your line. So you don't have to know the y-intercept to graph a line. Okay? All right, so let's do the next one. Find an equation of the line with slope 2 thirds containing the point negative 1, negative 5. Now, this doesn't specify what form, so I'm going to use point slope. So here's the m. This would be x1, and this would be y1. And I'm going to sub those in to this right here. So my equation would be y. If I subtract a negative 5, it becomes plus 5 equals m times x. Subtract negative 1, it becomes plus 1. We're done. That's it. Leave it. Now, if it feels unfinished to you, distribute. But you're going to have to distribute a two-thirds and subtract five. You're going to have to deal with some fractions. 
so it is often just easier to leave it. Question? Okay, I don't know B, but I could still graph it if I needed to. I'd plot that ordered pair. I'd rise 2, run 3. Rise 2, run 3, connect my points. Okay? All right. Oh, this little guy should look familiar to you. The slope of a line containing these two ordered pairs is found by subtracting y's over subtracting x's. Change in y over change in x. What is this? What do we call it? Slope formula. Yeah, that's our handy dandy slope formula. And what's another expression we use for change in y over change in x? Rise over run. Okay, and I'm going to throw in a Greek letter here. I'm going to say this is delta y over delta x. Delta in math and science means change. So change in y over change in x. How much did your y change? You would subtract it. How much did your x change? Subtract it. Okay, so let's find the slope of the line containing these points. Okay, you guys set up your slope formula. I'll do it also, but I'm not going to talk through it, and then we'll compare. Okay, so find M for me. I good with that? Negative 3 over 2. Now, it's fine to leave the negative down on the uh, bottom in the denominator. I usually will either put it with the numerator or out front because sometimes they tend to get lost. Oh, guys, let me ask you this. Does this have to be y2? I mean, I know it's the second order pair that's listed, but sometimes I'll shift the order if it makes it easier, like if I don't have to subtract negatives. So I could get the same slope by saying 6 minus 9 over negative 2 minus negative 4. That gives me negative 3. That becomes plus positive over 2. So you get the same thing. Y2 doesn't have to be the second ordered pair. You just have to draw from the same ordered pair first for X and Y. All righty. Okay, what does LTD mean or represent? Anybody? Limited. It's like a corporation um, abbreviation. So Rags Limited, a clothing firm, has fixed cost of $10,000 a year. These costs, such as rent, maintenance, and so on, must be paid no matter how much the company produces. How many of you have taken any business classes? Okay, so you, you've probably heard some of these expressions that we're going to use. Um, in financial lit, I don't know that they use any of that, um, but their um, economics, you probably use that term some, fixed costs. Okay, so if I have a company, my fixed costs, or even a school, let's say I'm running a school, like my fixed costs are teacher salary, power for the school, um, trash pickup, things like that, that even when we're not here during breaks, those things still have to be paid, right? So those are what your fixed costs are. So if you have a company, you are still expected to pay rent for your building, or um, power, or Wi-Fi, things like that, even maybe on the weekend or holiday when you're shut down. So that's why they're called fixed costs. Okay, so this company has $10,000 fixed costs. To produce X units of a certain kind of suit, it costs $20 per suit or per unit in addition to the fixed cost. So you have your fixed cost, but once you're up and actually the company's running, you have other costs that are associated, right? All right, so these are called variable costs. 
for producing X of these suits is 20 times X dollars. These costs are due to the amount of produced and stem amount produced and stem from items such as material, wages, fuel, and so on. Okay, so total cost of producing X suits a year is given by this function. C of X equals variable cost plus fixed cost. Okay, so doesn't that make sense? The cost of running my business are those costs that are going to be the same every single month, no matter what, plus the variable costs. Like maybe if I'm making suits, maybe um, ahead of summer, I need extra suits because there are a lot of weddings in the summer. So I'm going to ramp up production. That's going to be a variable cost. Maybe in October, nobody's buying suits, so I don't produce as many. So, so it fluctuates, it varies, so that's why it's called a variable cost. Well, my total cost of running the business is both of those costs added together, which is the 20x plus the 10,000. Okay, we are going to graph the variable cost, the fixed cost, and the total cost functions, and then figure out the total cost of producing 100 suits or 400 suits. And I do have a graph on the other side. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to get three different colors. One could be your pencil, but I have colored pencils over here if you don't have colored pens on you. So grab two other colors. It could be highlighters, pens, colored pencils, whatever, but find three total colors to graph with. It just makes it more fun if you're using colors. And the different graphs can stand out. Okay, why did I only give you basically first quadrant in this graph? Yeah, those costs are never going to be negative. We're never getting money back for running the power. So we only need first quadrant. All right, so we have to decide what kind of scale and what each axis is even going to represent. And then uh, once we do that, we'll figure out the kind of scale. Okay, so what is my X value in this situation? It is variable, but what does X represent? to produce X units of a certain kind of suit. Okay, so do you think if X is number of suits, let me get a pen that's not so wide. Okay, so number of suits being produced will be what the X axis represents. Do you think we're just gonna be selling one, two, three, four, five suits? Probably, I hope not. If we want to make any money, that's probably not going to be the case. Okay, so how many is this problem asking us about? It's asking about at least 400. All right, so what kind of scale might be useful on this graph? Hmm? Go up by hundreds? I think that's probably wise. Okay, so let's just use 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Okay, what does the y-axis represent here? Graph the variable cost, the fixed cost, the total cost. What's the y-axis? The cost in dollars, right? Okay, <clears throat> look at these equations. We want to graph the variable cost, the fixed cost, and the total cost function. Here's the total cost equation. Here's the fixed cost. It's just y equals 10,000. And the variable cost is 20x. If I'm graphing the equation y equals 10,000, and this equation has 10,000 as its y-intercept and then a positive slope. What kind of scale should I use over here? 
maybe go by ten thousands okay because um, I don't know what this big total cost is maybe even five thousands would be useful let's see. I, I think I'm gonna go by five but put more more in here Riley so I'm gonna go ten thousand twenty thousand thirty thousand but then I'm going to put a little mark there, there, and there. So that's 5, 15, and 25. So I want about 5,000 going up to 30,000. If I need to go higher, I've got a little more right there. <clears throat> I didn't give myself enough room there. Okay, all right, so let's write our fixed cost equation. What is the fixed cost equation? Just y equals 10,000. That's it. y equals 10,000. What does that line look like if I graph it? It's a horizontal line, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to put a little code here. Whatever color you are using to graph that, just sort of put it out next to it. Okay, so 10,000 straight horizontal line. Okay, for my next one, let's graph variable cost. Okay, what is this equation? Y equals variable cost for producing X suits is 20X. Okay, pick a color there. I'm going to use pink for that one. Okay, how am I going to graph? And this is going to take some estimating, or um, I'll show you how else we'll, we'll get there. But how am I going to graph 20x? Well, it's got a y-intercept of 0, but I'm going to go up by 20s. But look, my scale is 5,000. That's going to be a little hard to do. So what I'm going to do, and we can use our calculator for it, I'm just going to get some ordered pairs that are along the line for these values that I've marked, plot those and then connect them. Okay, so if x is 100, I want to figure out what 20 times 100 is. Now we can probably do that in our head, can't we? What would we get? 20 times 100? 2,000. Okay, then it's actually a little bit hard to plot, but we'll, we'll guesstimate. Okay, what if it's 200? Now what do we have? 200 times 20. 4,000? 4, Let's go on down here to 500. What if x is 500? Then I have what? 10,000. Oh, that, that one's easy. That actually intersects with that green line that I made. Okay, so let's connect those. Okay, our last one is total cost. And that equation is the 20x plus 10,000. The variable plus the fixed. Okay, let's get a different color here. Okay, so how would I graph that? That one has a y-intercept of 10,000, and the slope is 20x. So I'm going to do the same thing and pick a couple of points here along my x-axis, plug them into this equation, plot them, and then I'll connect the lines. What do you know about this line and the one we just drew? They are going to be parallel because they have the same slope. 
Okay, so let's plug 100 into this equation here. So 20 times 100 plus 10,000. 12,000 is my y value. It's going to be a little bit above that line. And I'm going to jump on down to 500 and plug that in. So 500 is 20 plus 10,000. I get 20,000. Okay, so then I can connect those. Like that. Question? Okay. All right. Does it make sense that this total cost is totally above the fixed cost? Yeah, your total cost is never going to drop below the, the fixed cost, right? Okay, so we didn't answer our question back here. What is the total cost of producing 100 suits and 400 suits? Actually, we did with those order pairs that we just plotted. The cost of 100 suits... Um, just as a reminder, this is what we did. And we got 12,000. Make sure we put the dollars in there because that's the unit of measure here. And then the cost of 400 suits. Would be 20 times 400 plus 10,000 which was 20,000. Okay. Question on that. Okay. We don't often graph lines that are like this, do we? We are usually using little bitty numbers, but out in the real world, if you're graphing linear equations, they're probably more like this, not 5x plus 2. Okay. When a business sells an item, it receives the price paid by the consumer that is normally greater than the cost to the business of producing the item. Um, a, the total revenue that a business receives is the product of the number of items sold and the price paid per item. Thus, if Riggs Limited sells X suits at $80 per suit, the total revenue, R of X, in dollars is given by R of X equals the unit price, that would be your 80, times how many they sell, so we get an equation of 80X. If C of X is 20X plus 10,000, graph R and C using the same set of axes. Okay. Yes. So I have that... Um, no, should we just put it on this graph as well? Let's see if there's a reason why I shouldn't do that. Mm. All right, we'll keep going. We'll use the graph on the next page. Okay, so we're going to do that in a second. Continues, though. The total profit that a business receives is the amount left after all costs have been subtracted from the total revenue. Thus, if P of X represents the total profit when X items are produced and sold, we have profit equals revenue minus cost. Okay, so revenue is what you're bringing in. Cost is what you have going out. Once you take everything you've brought in and subtract everything going out, what's left over, which is hopefully positive, is called your profit. Okay, so revenue minus cost is profit. Determine the profit and draw its graph using the same set of axes as was used for the graph in part A. But we're going to do that down here at the bottom. Um, the company will break even at the value of X for which the profit is zero. That is, you don't make money, but you're also not losing money. This is the point at which the revenue and the cost are equal. Find the break-even value of X. Okay, so this one I did scale for you. Um, notice I have negative on here. Why is that on here now? Okay, 
you, you can lose money in a business, right? Like your costs are never going to be negative, but you might make a negative profit. So now we, we kind of have to account for some negative possibilities here. Okay, so we are going to flip over on the page and find our revenue and our cost functions. Remember back here, revenue was given by ADX. Okay, so I'm going to bring that one over here. We're going to graph that. So revenue is 80 times X. For every suit I'm selling, I'm bringing in $80. Okay, our cost function was 20X plus 10,000. Okay, so this represents how much is coming in, how much is going out. Okay, so we are going to graph both of these. Okay, so let's do revenue first. I have a y-intercept of 0 and a slope of 80. Okay, let's do the same thing. Let's just pick some points along the axis, find those y-values and plot those. So if I multiply 100 times 80, then that's 8,000. If I multiply 300 times 80, that's going to be 24,000. What did I multiply? 300. Okay, so that's kind of steep there. Stop me if you have a question. Okay, now let's do our cost function. It now has a y-intercept of 10,000. And it has a smaller slope. It has a slope of 20. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to plug in 100 and then 300 and see where those points take me. So 20 times 100 plus 10,000 gives me 12,000. 300 times 20 plus 10,000 gives me 16,000. Right. One of those isn't quite right. Let's see what 400 is. It's 20 plus 10,000, 18,000. Okay. I think some of mine were a little overestimated there. Okay. All right, so this is my cost. And this is my revenue. Money in, money out. Okay, so clearly they do meet or intersect. They intersect right here somewhere. I don't know exactly where that is yet, but I'm about to find it. Um, and so that would be my, my break-even value. That is where the money coming in and going out are exactly the same. So I'm not making money, but I'm also not losing money. Okay, um, so we want to find that break-even value. How can I do this? I mean, I know I can guesstimate. It's, it looks like it's a little less than 200, but how can I find it exactly? Mm -hmm. Set them equal. Is that what you were going to say? Absolutely. If I want to know where those y values are equal, then I'm going to set those two equations equal to each other. So let's do that. I'm going to say 80x equals 20x plus 10,000. Subtract 20x. Divide by 60. Okay, so it's a portion of a suit. Should we round up or round down? 
probably doesn't make a huge difference since it is above is this what you guys got to since it is above half I'm gonna go ahead and round up and say it's a hundred sixty seven what what's X units suits is the break-even point Do you think companies actually analyze stuff like this? I thought they do, yeah. If I was making something, I'd want to know how many I needed to make in order to make a profit. So in other words, if I have a month where I am selling 160 suits, I'm losing money. If I'm selling 200 suits the next month, then I'm making money. So I'm very interested in that, that break-even point. Like, okay, we cleared it. That means we're in the black. If you're losing money, it's called being in the red. Have you heard those expressions? Alrighty, next page. Okay, this, this one I, I put the graph on here for you. Okay, so to find the profit, we're taking revenue minus cost. This is a big concept that we will use over and over, that profit is revenue minus cost, because actually calculus is a huge aspect of economics. Not at the high school level, because not everyone has taken calculus. Um, but if you plan on studying or majoring in, in economics in college, calculus is at the root of the math of that. Okay, so here's our revenue. Here's our cost. And if we combine like terms here, we get 60x minus 10,000. Okay, so the graph of profit is shown by the heavy line. So this is our profit right here. Okay, we just graphed this stuff on the previous page. This was our revenue, and this one is our cost. Okay, so revenue and cost we just graphed. I've just taken that graph and thrown in the profit for us here. Okay, um, the red portion of the line, which you can't tell because it's in black and white, shows a negative profit or loss. The black portion of the line shows the positive profit or gain. Where would those be? Where do you think the red and the black are? When am I making money according to this profit function? Remember that break-even point that we talked about? It should line up with that point right there. This down here tells me I have negative profit. Okay, negative profit is no bueno. You're losing money. All of this up here is positive profit, and it coincides with that break-even point. So once you go past the point where revenue and cost are the same, then remember I said you're, you're in the black, you're starting to make money. So this graph is the black portion, and this was red because we say if you're in the red, you're losing money. Okay, so all of this is positive profit. All right, so to find the break-even value, we already did this. We set revenue equal to cost. Question? Oh, you yeah, sure. Okay, last little bit of summary here. So graphs of functions that are straight lines, which are linear functions, are characterized by an equation of the type y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and 0b is the y-intercept, the point at which the graph crosses the y-axis. The point slope equation of a line is this one right here, and that's the one that might be new to you, where x1, y1 is a point on the line and m is the slope. I am done. All right, so you have some homework. Oh, good timing. Right there. So get started on that or seniors you might want to take a look at that um, application for scholarships and see what it looks like hello not sure okay uh -huh. Jacob, Armas wants to see you for a minute you know where her office is now right or do you do you know where her office is it's like near the front like up the staircase yes yes all right